Okay, so I've described the core technologies of the mesh, the meta cryptography, the data at rest encryption, and uniform data fingerprints. And none of those is a an internet protocol. So where's the internet protocol? Well, I'll explain that here, and it's called the mesh service. And unlike most internet protocols, a mesh service has a rather different relationship to a mesh account. You see, the idea is that a mesh account should be something that belongs to the user and should be portable. So it shouldn't be sticky. It, you know, if they use Gmail or they use Yahoo, they should be able to switch from one to the other with as little fuss and as little impact as possible. Okay, well, how's that uh, possible? Well, the first thing is that a mesh account is created by the user before they attach to a service. And it has a set of public and private keys within the account for encryption signature, whatever. And the key that is used to sign the pr account profile has a fingerprint. So the key that's used to sign the account profile is permanent for the life of this account. And its fingerprint is the fingerprint that is used to represent the account. So this um, this fingerprint is going to be constant for the whole life of the account. And if Alice changes from one service provider to another, her account fingerprint won't change. And so we can have a lookup directory in the cloud somewhere that tells Alice where to, tells Bob, Doug, Carol and so on, where to find her at a new address. So even if, if she moves from example.com to example.net and example.com refuses to provide forwarding, we've still got a way that Alice can move her account. So the mesh is all about empowering the individual. So the account itself is a container for the catalogs, um, which contain her device uh, catalog, her contacts back catalog, her passwords catalog, all the persistent state that have to do with that digital identity. And also the spools of inbound and outbound messages that were sent and received when it was connected to a service. Okay, so where does the service come in? Well, Alice combined her account to a service. And this service will have a DNS address. So it's going to be called example.com. And Alice finds, well, Alice's client uh, finds this service using the internet mechanism designed for discovering services, the DNS. So all the information required to find that service with redundancy, reliability, and so on, and to find the necessary configuration details should all be in the DNS. And for this, we're using DNS service discovery and looking at the SRV and the TXT records in the DNS to tell us where the hosts providing service for the mesh are and to pull up the configuration of the particular hosts. And so when we bind to a serve, when Alice binds to a service, the first thing she will do is to use the DNS SRV mechanism to connect up. Now, as an aside here, in order to scale up to real scale, you know, millions of users, once she's actually instantiated her account at example.com, so she has become Alice at example.com, the, the service will send her back down a service connection statement. And part of that service connection statement and the associated activation mechanism will be, could be, a set of hosts that Alice is to use for her future communications. 
And what this means is that example.com can partition up their user base into manageable chunks of you know, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 users at a time and handle those as a blob by providing each of them a host address to use for, or rather a service address to use for the ongoing conversation. And that's a really useful technique because that's something that we can then use for denial of service mitigation. So we're using the example.com SRV and TXT for the initial connection. We're not necessarily going to use it for the ongoing communication because it might be that we want to specialize that so that we don't have the problem of, hey, I've got a hundred million users for my webmail service. And now I have to have a two layer, uh, two tier server architecture where the first tier just spends its time working out which of the back tier to direct the uh, re response, questions and responses to. I mean, that's a bit silly, isn't it? So we can get a bit of scalability in that by moving that two-tier architecture into the discovery and the persistence uh, of that discovery model. Okay, so as I said, Alice can change her service at any time. If she decides to move from example.com to example.net, she will download all her data from example.com. She will synchronize one device and then she will create a new account at example.net and upload it. Fairly simple. Or maybe example.com and example.net can just port the data automatically. Doesn't. Okay, so every mesh protocol, and how I'm describing the client server protocol, they all use DNS discovery and they all use JSON and JSON binary encoding, and they all use the DARE envelope for authentication. Potentially, they support multiple transport protocols. At the moment, only HTTPS, that is HTTP over TLS, is defined, but all the protocols have been designed to allow a really snappy response over a UDP only transport and this is not something that I'm focused on right now because we've got Quick that is in progress and I doubt that Quick is actually going to end up being the protocol that we want to use for web services because it is so tightly bound to and tuned for the requirements of HTTP2. But what we're probably going to want to do is to take a subset of that work and make something of it that is really optimized for web services. So that's not something that I want to get into right now, but it's something that we can come back to and make it so that sending and receiving mess messages is a single UDP packet or maybe two, three, four UDP packets rather than having to set up and tear down TCP connections all the time. So the first message that is sent by the client to the host is a hello message which specifies the version of the service that the client understands and the type of credentials. It, and, and then the service responds with the types of credential that it can accept for authentication, the configuration of that service and all that, that stuff. And at that point, they perform a key exchange to authenticate the client for future use via a ticket mechanism. So just as we do in TLS, we have fast open after the initial authentication. We want to have that same capability built into the mesh service protocol, which is working at a slightly higher level. Okay, so the mesh 
client to service protocol has seven basic functions. It manages the account. So it, it supports account creation and account deletion. It manages the connection of devices to a mesh account. So there's a connect and a complete method that are used in that protocol. And I'll go through that whole uh, protocol flow separately in another podcast. And it manages the synchronization of containers. Once a account is bound to a service, the service becomes the authoritative source of the containers in the account. So if we synchronize this to this, then the contacts, the authoritative copy of the contacts catalog is now in the service. And so if the client, if a client device is looking to synchronize with the service to upload some changes to the contacts database, it needs to do three things. First of all, it asks for the status of the authoritative copy of the contacts catalog. So, and then it looks to see, am I missing any parts of that catalog? If so, it will pull, it downloads the pieces that it's missing. And having synchronized its copy of the contacts catalog to the authoritative master, it then can upload the changes it is proposing. First checking, of course, to make sure that the stuff that it downloaded doesn't conflict. You know, you don't want to be uploading a record that has changed. Uh, you don't want to be deleting a contact entry that has been previously changed or whatever. You know, you, you, you want to be, um, you want to tell the user, hey, you might want to rethink this. Or maybe you don't. So the mesh client, pro client service model is basically seven methods and that's it. And those seven methods manage the creation of the account, the connection of devices to the account, and the synchronization of any DARE sequence, which means that a single mechanism can synchronize any list of messages or any uh, catalog of items. So seven methods really do it all as far as the mesh client protocol is concerned. Okay, so Okay, so we've done the client to the service protocol. Well, what if Alice here is talking to Bob here at example.net? For this transfer to take place, we need an additional protocol, which is the intermesh protocol. And this is basically just a post command. So example.com, when it connects to example.net, it will go through the hello piece if it wants to obtain example.net's uh, profile, etc. Or it might just take it as read. It might be cached from a previous exchange. Uh, and then it just it has a message here from Alice. It just post it just as standard SMTP does. And it's your standard four corner model. So the post command is really just a subset of the um, client to service protocol. Um, it doesn't really add a great deal. And of course, this is the point at which as I keep going back to, we use the contacts catalog to perform access control on the in, in on the uh, inbound mail service, so that Bob doesn't get spammed, and we want to provide some sort of abuse filtry on the outbound service as well, so that you know example.com doesn't want Alice sending a million messages in a minute. 
Okay, so I've talked about the types of communication, but I've not really talked about the transport layer, the, the security here. And, you know, the mesh being a security protocol, uh, you probably expect there to be some security. And, of course, there is. Uh, but first, let's get a clean board. Okay, so remember back when we were doing signing of DARE envelopes and I was talking about whether you should do sign, then encrypt, or encrypt, then sign, and came to the conclusion that... Uh, we want to do both. Well, here we've got a choice of three different places where we can put security in the mesh transport. So the first layer that we can put it in is the transport layer. So we can do our TLS. And, you know, that is the workhorse for you know, cryptography on the internet today. And it has some really nice features. If you operate at the transport layer, you provide confidentiality protection against the whole message, including the headers. So you get protection against traffic analysis, which is something you don't go get if you move further up the stack. You know, if you see an S-MIME message, the payload is encrypted, but the headers tell you a heck of a lot. So the transport layer uh, provides us with confidentiality protection against that traffic analysis attack, but it doesn't protect the data itself. And so when we have our store and forward, so we have Alice here posting to Bob. A copy of the message ends up on Alice's server during the transit at least, and then at Bob's server. And it's there until Bob fetches it at the very least. And it could be there for all time because, you know, that's just the way mail servers tend to uh, behave. And so we really want to encrypt at the message layer as well. And that gives us some really good features because it gives us end-to-end -end security. And it is the hook where we can put our access control. TLS is very good for authenticating the service. TLS client auth, well, let's face it, it has never really worked. It can be used in a small number of niche applications, but it's never been properly supported in the browsers. And it really doesn't quite mean meet the needs of your application because the problem is that in a real application you use TLS for multiple hops within the data center and so what you see from the outside as a single TLS connection turns into multiple connections and here we have a case with mess messaging we want to be able to perform access control here not just here. And so what you want is the ability to put access control on your actual message, uh, on your actual interactions with the service within the HTTP payload. Um, yeah, I know that you can try and put the stuff into the HTTP headers. Been there, done that, doesn't work. Just use H I just use HTTP as a dumb transport. I get one feature out of HTTP, and that is it increases my number of ports. It multiplexes on port 443 and port 80 to give me as many ports as I need by a different URI stem, URL stem. Uh, that's all I use it for. I don't use... Uh, HTTP authentication, uh, don't use any of that. Stick it all in the payload where I can do everything in JSON and don't need to worry about any of that. So we need me message layer security and that provides us with uh, access control, but it doesn't provide us with traffic analysis protection and doesn't provide data isolation. And the problem here is that when you're talking about 
TLS being end to end? Well, the problem is that the ends of your internet communication are not the same as the end of the ends of the communication between Alice and Bob. So here we've got that storm forward piece coming in. Well, if we're talking about cryptographic key material being moved, well, we want the end to continue right into Bob's device. And we still want to have that packet of data encrypted inside that device. And so we also want data level security. And as you probably guessed from now, the answer in the mesh is that we do security at all three layers. We have the triple lock. This layer we use TLS and this layer we use DARE envelope. And same again. Cryptography is cheap. People are expensive. It's much cheaper to do a lot of cryptography and encrypt at multiple layers than to try and work out which silver bullet is going to hit your uh, target. It doesn't work in the modern internet. Okay, so I've given you an overview of how these services work. What I want to do next is to show you the mesh in action. Only to show it in action, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the command line tool. There has been a GUI version in the past, but at the moment we've only got a shell tool. And the reason for that is you can always wrap a graphical user interface around a shell. You cannot wrap a shell around a GUI or a GUI around a GUI. You know, once you've gone to a graphical user interface, the only thing that can use it is another human. If you have a command line interface, it can be activated by another machine and that allows us to use the mesh from inside scripts and one of those scripts can be a GUI. So I'm going to show you the command line version of the mesh uh, which exposes the deep level of, you know, a bit more of the deep level about what's going on. And so please take it at read that there will be a graphical version at some point. And, you know, hey, if you really want to go ahead and be the person who writes it, you know, if you want to be the Mark Andreessen and Eric Binner of the Mesh, please go ahead and be my guest. So, yeah. Okay, so that is the Mesh um, as it stands today. Again, in, in the next presentation, I'm going to be showing you some mesh service features that aren't implemented right now, but could be and make a lot of sense. Use it, leveraging the same mesh service architecture that I described earlier in, in this presentation. So please stay for that and please like and please subscribe because the more people that we have subscribing and liking, the more, the, the better the case I can make that the mesh needs to happen. Thank you very much.